Hello, welcome back to our lecture series for Western Civilization 101. We heard on our last lecture by Dr. Robison about the Chaldeans and the Assyrians, some different groups of people that dominate in the ancient Near East. Um, today, Dr. Robison continues um, with the ancient Near East and discusses a very powerful and a very um, important group of people named the Persians. They are located in current day Iran. And like I said before, they're a little bit to the west of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, the ancient Mesopotamian civilization area. Um, the Persians, of course, will eventually, as you will discover, create a huge empire. The Persians will um, go across and, and conquer Mesopotamia. They will go into what is now modern-day Turkey. You may see it on some older maps. Um, it may have Asia Minor written there, or it may even have Anatolia. Either way, Turkey, Asia Minor, Anatolia, same, same region, same place. It's right there um, above the Mediterranean Sea. Um, it borders the Mediterranean Sea. You can say it's kind of at the top, and then Egypt is at the bottom, and then on the side you have what is now Israel, you have Lebanon, you know, modern-day countries. We'll actually discuss some of the um, others that lived in that region. Um, we've discussed the Phoenicians, for example. So the Persians dominate just a massive amount of territory, and they've conquered a lot of different people different groups of people. So it's extremely fascinating to discover how the Persians managed to make it work. And they did for quite a long time. They made this empire work for quite a long time. Dr. Robison discusses famous Persian rulers um, that will come about through the history of this pe these people. You know, it seems that the Persians have to come up with a, a more efficient governing structure because when you have territories that are so far flung, um, you're, you don't exactly have a plane or a car that you can zip around in. You have to really find ways to keep, um, keep these territories as together as you can. So we'll discover they had to come up with a better transportation system to link all of their um, empire, and they do so. Um, it's, it's really fascinating. They have to come up with, like I said, a better way of governing, and they do under a man named Darius. They create um, satrapies, and they have governors, kind of like governors. They're called satraps answering to the king. They have like a, it's called a, he's called a king's eye that goes out and checks on people, reports back. Um, so very efficient. It seems that the, the problem with the Persians, eventually it, it wasn't their government. They seem to have kind of got things together on that. They definitely improved transportation throughout their empire. Um, problem with the Persians is that they start fighting the Greeks. We have what's called the Persian Wars. And uh, this does not um, turn out so well for the Persians. In fact, things are going to start going downhill after the Persians get involved with the Greeks uh, because the Greeks will eventually win that war. And, and it's truly amazing because, you know, here you have this Persian empire, very strong, very massive. I mean, they had managed to conquer all these other people, and, and yet, here they are fighting the Greeks, and they end up, in the long run, they end up losing the battle. And we'll start to see, as far as Persian history is concerned, there are um, uh, not as effective kings that come about after, um, pretty much after the Persian Wars. I mean, Darius I, he was the first, the guy that, with the transportation and the guy that set up the, um, the different... Um, style of governments with the with these satrapies and uh, and things of that nature. He was very effective. Of course, it's Darius the first that gets involved in the war with Greece, with Athens, and with Sparta, the city states, 
we'll, uh, we'll discuss that in Unit 2. You'll learn more about, so you'll actually probably hear a little bit about the Persians when we start our Unit 2 material, when we start talking about the Greeks. It seems like there's a lot of very uh, inefficient um, rulers that come about in the Persian Empire after the Persian Wars. And uh, Dr. Robson mentions a few of these uh, pivotal rulers. Their assassination attempts, um, intrigue, uh, things are just going downhill. Um, conspiracies, attempted assassinations, um, and eventually, eventually, the Persian Empire will be conquered by a very famous historical figure. His name is Alexander the Great. You will learn quite a lot more about Alexander the Great in future lectures. He, of course, some people say he is Greek. He is actually not Greek. He is from Macedonia, which is north of Greece. Just want to point that out because everybody thinks of him as Greek. But Alexander the Great, he starts his own conquest campaign and comes into the Persian Empire and will conquer it. And so even though the Persian Empire was so vast and so successful there for a while, it also will not last. Just like we've seen other groups fade away, um, the Persians will not last as well as an empire in the ancient Near East. Now, Dr. Robison also discusses um, with the Persians, very important topic, their religion. Um, it's different. It's so different um, than the religions that we have, have learned about in previous lectures with the Sumerians and their polytheistic many worship of many gods and their um, pessimistic outlook on life um, that was discussed as well. That they had been placed on earth to be servants to the gods. We um, discussed, of course, um, Egyptian religion and how that was different as well with the afterlife and, and also polytheistic except for a little bit there with Akhenaten or uh, he's also known as Amenhotep IV. So he, he brought in a ton, but for the most part, Egyptian religion was polytheistic. The Persian religion is different again. It's called Zoroastrianism. I know, a lovely word, Zoroastrianism. And it's interesting because there's two gods, dualism, dual too. There's a good one and a bad one. Sound familiar? Okay. Um, some historians state that when uh, the Jews, uh, the Judeans, when, the, um, when they were captured and brought to the city of Babylon and they were held captive there, it was called the Babylonian captivity, and they remained, um, their culture remained together, they remained tight, and, and their religion became even stronger. Some historians state that this is when the Judeans became uh, knowledgeable about this dualism, um, Zoroastrianism, this good and, and evil God. And so Dr. Robison will discuss a little bit, a lot more in depth, I'm sure, about um, what Zoroastrian is, Zoroastrianism is, and the different practices um, of the people that, that worship this way. And he'll also discuss another interesting topic in dealing with the Persians, and it's called Mithraism. I'll leave it, leave it to him to discuss that as well. But Mithraism is actually very fascinating. So, so let's discover a little bit more about the Persians. The ancient Persians created the largest empire ever created up to their own time. That empire proved to be short-lived, but its influence remains with us even today. The Persian Empire originated in what is nowadays modern Iran, and contrary to what many people believe, the occupants of modern Iran are still Persian by and large rather than Arab. Iran is situated on a very large plateau, and that area is characterized by very hot summers 
very cold winters. It's the, the western half of the plateau that is the most habitable and it is there that the Persian culture grew up. Early on, there were two groups of people there, both Indo-European speaking groups who are sometimes referred to as Aryans. The Medes occupied the northwest portion of what is nowadays Iran, and the Persians occupied the southwest. The Medes, as we have already seen, were the first to create an empire. The first time that they appear in our historical sources is in the 9th century BCE. Their legendary founder was a figure named Deaces, but we know very little about him other than that the legend exists. We do know that the capital of the Median Empire was in Ecbatana, and that the Medeans were very excellent horsemen and warriors. They fought a series of wars against their neighbors, the Assyrians to the west and the Scythians to the north. And during the time that the Medeans were dominant, the Persians were actually their vassals. There are two Median kings that are particularly important. The first of these, who has already come up in the story a time or two, is Cyaxares, who was king of Medea from 625 to 585 BCE. It was he who drove the Scythians out of the Iranian region. He also adopted the use of mounted archers, that is, cavalry using bows and arrows. He is the Median who allied with the Chaldean king Nabopolassar, the father of Nebuchadnezzar, and was important in destroying the, old, or the, the Neo-Assyrian Empire. In 614 BCE, Cyaxares captured the Assyrian city of Assur, and two years later in 612, he participated with Nabopolassar and others in the joint sack of Nineveh that represents the death of the Assyrian Empire. Later on, he and his troops headed westward into eastern Anatolia, or modern-day Turkey, uh, which they proceeded to occupy, and it was he who made the famous truce with the Lydians in 585 after their two armies stopped fighting because of a solar eclipse. That left the Lydians in charge of western Anatolia and the Medians in possession of the east. Cyaxares was followed on the throne of Medea by Astyages, who ruled from 585 to 550. Initially, he enjoyed considerable stability. There were four powers in the regions that were more or less in balance at the beginning of his reign. The Medes, or Medeans, the Chaldeans in Mesopotamia, the Egyptians, and the Lydians. But in 550 BCE, one of Astyages' vassals, Cyrus of Persia, rebelled against him. Astyages' own army revolted, handed him over to Cyrus, and that was the end of the Median Empire. Thus, it proved to be very short-lived. But it gave rise to an even greater, more powerful empire that was, the was founded by the same Cyrus who overthrew Astyages and who we now know as Cyrus the Great. Cyrus would create what is known as the Achaemenid Dynasty and the Achaemenid Empire. There are a great number of legends about Cyrus, many of which are found in the work of the ancient Greek historian Herodotus, including a miraculous birth and other near miraculous feats of military prowess. What we can say about him for sure is that he welded the Persians and the Medes into a single state. He then launched one of the greatest careers of conquest in history. In 546, he conquered Lydia and the Ionian Greek states to the west of that. In 539, he overran the Babylonian Empire, and it was Cyrus who, in fact, freed the Hebrew leaders in Babylon and allowed them to go back to Jerusalem. He went on to consolidate his empire and was launched on further expansion when, in 530, he was killed in battle, leaving behind a vast empire to his heir. That was his son, Cambyses II, who ruled from 530 to 523, and whom Herodotus describes as a mad tyrant. Whatever the case may be, in 525, 
Cambyses invaded Egypt. He ousted Samtik III, the last of the Saite rulers of Egypt, and proceeded to consolidate his hold there. That is no small accomplishment and, of course, greatly expanded the territory of the Persian Empire. But while Cambyses was in Egypt, a revolt broke out against him back in Persia in 522. And en route back to Persia to deal with the revolt, he died, perhaps as the result of assassination, perhaps as the result of some other cause. Whatever the case may be, he left most of his army in Egypt and they literally disappeared. Their whereabouts were unknown until fairly recently archaeologists uncovered many bodies of Persian soldiers in their armor in the Egyptian desert and identified them as the lost army of Cambyses. Cambyses, of course, being dead, the throne lay open for someone else. And the man who ultimately seized it was a, was a king known as Darius I, who would go on to rule from 522 to 486 BCE. There is some question about whether Darius was a legitimate ruler or a usurper. Uh, the circumstances of his taking the throne are rather cloudy. But whatever the case may be, once he became the Persian ruler, he proved to be a great one. By 516 BCE, he had expanded the Persian Empire in the east all the way to the Indus River in northern India. In 514, he attempted to expand their influence north of the Black Sea, and there he failed. However, he almost immediately was able to annex territory to the west in Thrace and put down uh, in the early 490s BCE a revolt amongst the Ionians. His least successful military venture began in 490 when he invaded Greece, beginning what we know as the Persian Wars or Greco-Persian Wars. That year he was defeated by the Greeks in the famous Battle of Marathon and in 486 he died while preparing for a new invasion. But that's far from being all that Darius did. Darius was a great organizer a great consolidator, and a smart enough man to realize that even as he expanded his empire, it was also important to consolidate what he had conquered. Therefore, he set out to, make, to create a much more structured empire for the Persians, and he left behind a model that was later adopted by other rulers, most notably by the Romans. For one thing, he was a good administrator, and he proved to be a great lawgiver. He also gave the Persian army a much more regular structure. In the Persian army, the infantry were known as the 10,000 immortals. And if they weren't literally immortal, the 10,000 always remained for the moment that one of them died, he was immediately replaced by a new recruit. These men went into battle carrying bows, spears, swords, and shields, and were formidably disciplined and a real force on the battlefield. Sometimes they used chariots. Occasionally, uh, in desperate circumstances, they would attach very sharp blades to the wheels of those chariots. They also had cavalry, and that cavalry used not only horses, but sometimes camels and elephants. Darius also began the practice of drafting conquered people into the Persian army and treating them well so that they would be good soldiers and fight loyally for the empire. Persian kingship, or emperorship if you prefer, was absolute and hereditary. Darius added to it a great deal of ritual and ceremony that was intended to enhance the image of the emperor and the grandeur of the empire. It was he who began using a scepter, who adopted a very elaborate crown, who wore a purple robe, and so on, many uh, items of which were later adopted by other rulers imitating Darius. He went by the title of Great King, King of Kings, King in Persia, which is a real mouthful, but again establishes uh, his grandeur for others who are watching. He also established a very elaborate court, 
And one aspect of that court was that he kept a harem. Although within that harem, there was a single wife who was recognized as queen and as principal queen was the mother of the heir. Another of Darius's innovations was the decision to have four capitals rather than one. Now, the reason for this has to do with the way that ancient government operated. The Persian Empire was larger than any empire created up to this point. At the time, the only way for the emperor to make himself known to his people, to show his power to his people, was to literally physically be present among them. And the bigger the empire, the harder that is to do. These days, anytime a president, a governor, or even a mayor wants to make a, a presentation to the people, he simply has to go on television. We all know what the president and the governor look like because we see their pictures and their images every day but no such thing existed in the ancient world. Therefore, it was important for the emperor to make his presence felt either in person or through his emissaries, and having four capitals was one way to do that. One of the capitals was Susa, which was located in the old kingdom of Elam, and from which a great deal of the administration of the empire was done. Another was the old Mede capital of Ecbatana, where the emperors often spent their summers since it was cooler there. Another was Pesargade, which is in Persia, and the final was Persepolis, also in Persia, which was the ceremonial capital where coronations and other rituals took place. Another thing that the Persians did, beginning with Cyrus and then being expanded under Darius, was that they imitated the Assyrian model of subdividing the empire into smaller, more manageable units. In the case of the Persians, they divided all conquered territory outside of Persia into what were called satrapies. And in each satrapy, there was a local official called the satrap who handled local administration and answered directly to the emperor, giving the emperor eyes and ears in the countryside, so to speak. Satraps did three things primarily. They commanded the army locally, they enforced the law, and they collected taxes, thereby giving the emperor multiple arms out in the empire. Another thing that the Persians recognized was the importance of communication and transportation. Beginning with Cyrus and greatly increased under Darius, they built excellent roads, roads linking all of their major cities. The longest of these was the so-called Royal Road, which stretched from Susa all the way to Sardis and was some 1,700 miles long, quite an accomplishment in the ancient world. They also created an imperial postal service, which was designed to get messages for the emperor to various parts of the empire, but like the roads, it also functioned for private individuals and enhanced the economy, enhanced the ease of travel, and so on. In addition to road building, the Persians also built canals, notably a canal connecting the Nile River to the Red Sea. The Persian Empire, which is again very large, was a multilingual, multicultural empire. The languages that were included there, and this is only the major ones, included Old Persian, which is an Indo-European language, a language called Avestan, which was used for sacred matters, Aramaic, the language of the Aramaeans, which has been adopted by the Hebrews, uh, among others, was the, the lingua franca, the, the language that everyone did business in within the empire. But in Elam, the Elamites still spoke their language, in Babylon, the Babylonians still spoke late Babylonian, which is a modification of Akkadian. In Egypt, the Egyptians still spoke Egyptian. And in the Greek areas under Persian rule, the Greeks still spoke Greek. So very much a multilingual empire. In terms of Persian law, Darius did not create a single law throughout the empire, although he did codify the law of the Egyptians. But beginning with Cyrus, and again growing in, in impact under Darius, one of the things that the Persians did 
was to treat conquered people with a good deal of toleration. They didn't attempt to force every aspect of Persian law down the throats of those they conquered. They didn't attempt to force Persian religion down the throats of, they, of the people they conquered or Persian culture or anything else. Essentially, as long as conquered people obeyed the law, served in the army, and paid their taxes, they were allowed to go on using their own system of law, speaking their own language, following their own customs, and so on, which made for happier conquered people. And in fact, many of those conquered by Cyrus and Darius came to regard being part of the Persian Empire as a beneficial thing. It was safe, it was profitable, and therefore many people were happy to become subjects of the Persian Empire. The Persian economy included, among other things, uh, a great deal of prosperity for a great many people. It also, not surprisingly, involved systematic taxation by the emperors and their satraps. The government also supported financially both agriculture and trade, building both up because it was good for the empire, but also because they could tax it. They funded irrigation, as I have mentioned, they funded the building of roads. In addition, the Persian emperors introduced a system of weights and measures to make it easier to do business. They also introduced a form of gold coin known as the derrick, which also made it easier to do business. Everyone's using the same weights and measures. Everyone is using the same currency. And they supported the foundation of banks. Now, following the death of Darius, he was followed on the throne by his son Xerxes I. And with Xerxes, things begin to go downhill a bit. For the one thing, Xerxes abandoned the moderation of his predecessors and proved to be quite ruthless and intolerant as well as overly ambitious. He was successful in putting down a revolt that broke out in Egypt during his reign, and he also did the same in 482 BCE with a rebellion in uh, Babylon. But where his downfall came was in dealing with the Greeks. In 480, he invaded Greece, reviving the Greco-Persian wars. And initially, it looked as though he would be successful. The Persian army actually captured the city of Athens, sacked it, and burned much of it to the ground. Athens, of course, at this point, was one of the great city-states of Greece and one of the centers of a developing Greek democracy. But the Greeks fought back. In 480, at the Battle of Salamis, they defeated the Persian navy and forced the Persians to pull out many of their troops. In 479, at the Battle of Plataea, they pretty much annihilated the rest of the troops that were left behind in Greece, and Xerxes had to go back home and nurse his wounds. The fighting wasn't over, but from this point on, the Greeks really had the upper hand, and Xerxes had problems at home of his own, so much so that in 465, he wound up being assassinated. Over the next decades, there was a period of decline in the Persian Empire, uh, no further rulers of the caliber of Cyrus and Darius coming along, and rebellion and assassination became a more and more regular part of Persian life. The last two emperors of significance were, first of all, Artaxerxes III, who ruled uh, from 359 to 338, seemed poised for some greatness, uh, was able to put down rebellions in Egypt, Phoenicia, and Syria, but then was poisoned, a form of assassination, in 538. After a couple of years, he was replaced by Darius III, who put down yet another Egyptian revolt, but who had the misfortune to be on the receiving end of one of the greatest military campaigns in history. That is to say, he was the Persian Empire who found himself facing Alexander the Great. And as probably everyone knows, Alexander the Great 
conquered the entire Persian Empire, adopted the Persian imperial style himself, and enforced among the Persians the idea that he was not only their emperor, but also a god. And thus came to an end the Achaemenid Persian Empire, although we will see later on a new Persian Empire emerging after the career of Alexander. Now, one of the most important aspects of Persian culture was Persian religion. The early Iranian religion, the religion that preceded the rise of the Persian Empire, was not all that terribly different from what we find in many other places. There was a polytheistic religion amongst the early people of Iran or Persia. There, the gods were divided up basically into good gods who were called Ahuras and bad gods who were called Divas. The priestly class were a group of people known as the Magi, which is where we get that term from and also where we get the term magic, uh, who were a hereditary class of priests. That is to say, the right to be a priest passed down hereditarily among the Persians just as it did among the Levites, uh, among the Hebrews. The early uh, Persian religion did not have temples in the way that other ancient religions did. Rather, worship was carried out on hilltops or mountaintops, closer to the sky, presumably closer to the gods. Among the early Persians, there were three sacred ceremonies. The first of these was the lighting of sacred fires. And in fact, um, one of the symbols of Persian religion at this time was a fire symbol that we recognize for a much different reason today, and that is the swastika. Uh, the swastika was adopted, of course, by the Nazis in Germany uh, during the 20th century and has come to take on a very sinister meaning for everyone in the West. But it originated as a fire symbol among the ancient Persians and their neighbors to the southeast in India. The second kind of ceremony in early Persian religion, like that that you find in many other ancient religions, was animal sacrifice, sacrifice of animals to the gods. And the third was the drinking of something called heoma, which was a drink that was hallucinogenic and which caused those who drank it to see visions which they interpreted as being religious in nature. So that is the early uh, Persian religion. Polytheistic, a magi class of priests, worship on mountaintops consisting primarily of three sacred ceremonies involving fire, animal sacrifice, and the hallucinogenic drink, Haoma. However, what makes Persian religion so important in the history of religion and so important in the history of the Persians is the appearance of a figure known as Zoroaster, or as the Greeks called him, Zarathustra. Zoroaster is in some ways a very mysterious figure. For example, we don't know with certainty what century he lived in. If you look at the work of Zoroastrian scholars, the estimates range from the 12th century BCE all the way down to the 6th century BCE. But what is perhaps crucial about that is that whenever Zoroaster may have lived, his teachings were definitely in existence at the time that the Persians began their conquests. So wherever they went, the faith of Zoroaster went with them. This doesn't mean that they forced it upon people, but many of the conquered people in the Persian Empire voluntarily accepted the faith of Zoroaster, or Zoroastrianism as we call it, and it became extremely influential. Now, whenever Zoroaster may have lived, there certainly are a number of stories about him, and his teachings are fairly clear. There are miracle stories about him, just as there are about Cyrus and a number of other ancient figures. One of the stories 
uh, suggest that Zoroaster was the product of a virgin birth. Uh, a not uncommon notion in the ancient world, but one that is still uncommon enough to, to make it a bit special. At the age of 30, Zoroaster experienced a revelation. And one of the things that you may notice about ancient religious figures is that they often begin their careers as religious leaders at the age of 30. This is true of Jesus, for example. There's a reason for that. 30 was considered in the ancient world to be the age of mature adulthood. One achieved adulthood in stages, uh, starting with the beginning of puberty, going on to such uh, you know, milestones as the age of 21, but 30 was considered to be the age at which you might be wise enough to have something to say. And so leaders, whether religious or otherwise, tended to be in their 30s when their careers began. At the age of 30, Zoroaster experienced a revelation having to do with a god called Ahura Mazda. He then developed a very highly ethical religion, perhaps the most ethical religion in the ancient world thus far. He dropped animal sacrifice from this religion. He also dropped the use of the hallucinogenic drink Haoma, but he retained the fire ritual using fire as a symbol of truth. Now, who is Uhura Mazda? Well, according to the teachings of Zoroastrianism, Uhura Mazda is the one uncreated God, that is, the one eternal God who has always been and always will be. He is invisible. He is changeless. He is omniscient, that is to say, all-knowing, and He is omnipresent. He is everywhere. Ahura Mazda is taught by Zoroaster to be beyond human understanding. But he is known as a god of wisdom, a god of light, a god of truth, a god of righteousness, and the source of all good and morality, not unlike the god of the Hebrews. According to Zoroastrianism, there were seven stages by which the world was created. This began with the creation of the sky, then the creation of water, then of earth, then of vegetation, then of animals, then of humans, and then of fire. Now, how did this happen? According to Zoroastrianism, it was the work in part of a spirit known as the Spinta Mainyu, or Holy Spirit. The Spinta Mainyu himself created, or itself created, six individuals called the Amesha Spintas, or the six holy immortals, or six bright immortals, who they are sometimes called. They aided the Spinta Mainyu in creation, and they aided in governing the universe. They also sometimes are seen in Zoroastrian religion as what we would describe as archangels. So, you have Ahura Mazda, you have His Holy Spirit, the Spinta Mainyu, you have the six holy immortals, or Amesha Spintas. Now, here's where we get to something quite interesting about Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism is a dualistic religion. That is, it is, it is not purely polytheistic, like the older Persian religion and like most ancient religion is. But neither is it purely monotheistic like Hebrew religion or Christianity or Islam. It is dualistic. That is, it sees the forces of good and evil as being in opposition but of relatively equal force. And here's how that works. The Spinta Mainyu, who is good, the Holy Spirit, is served not only by the six bright immortals, but also by the Ahuras, the lesser gods, who are all good, and they are the forces of truth. But opposed to the Spintamanyu, the Holy Spirit of Ahura Mazda and his supporters, is an evil spirit known as the Angramanyu, 
or later on, this is shortened to simply Araman, and he is served by the Deivas, or demons, and he is the god of the lie. So, this been to mind you, the good Holy Spirit of Ahura Mazda and his uh, Ahuras are opposed by the Angramanyu, the evil spirit, and his devas or demons. Truth in opposition to the lie, goodness in opposition to evil, light in opposition to darkness. And they are thought to be in more or less balance and locked in a constant struggle. As the religion evolves, as the Zoroastrian theology develops, Zoroastrians come to see the entire cosmos as divided up between Ahura Mazda and His Holy Spirit on one hand and Araman or the Angramanyu on the other. In fact, Araman uh, becomes seen, comes to be seen as the great enemy of Ahura Mazda and he bears quite a bit of resemblance to the Hebrew Satan. There's a great deal of similarity here. The difference is that where, as in Hebrew and Christian and Islamic thought, Satan is seen as a fallen angel, Araman is seen as a godlike figure in and of himself. And so Ahura Mazda and Araman are in virtual equal balance. Now, this allows the Persians to do something that most ancient religions and most ancient thought systems have found it very difficult to do. And that is to explain the problem of evil. This is one of the great uh, daunting tasks of philosophy and religion throughout the ages, explaining why evil exists. One, of course, can, can impute it to the sinfulness of man, but then you're left with the question of, well, why is man sinful? One can impute it to uh, the influence in Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition of Satan, but then you have to ask, why is Satan evil? And that leads down all sorts of complicated roads that we need not go down right this minute. But the way that the Persians explain it is like this. There is a good God, there is an evil God, and they are both in competition. And they are so close in power that that competition will continue for a very long time. Now, Zoroastrianism does teach that ultimately Uhura Mazda will win out, and that creates a little bit of a problem too, because then you have to ask, well, if ultimately he's going to win out, why doesn't he win out now? If ultimately he's going to win out, doesn't that mean he's a little bit more powerful? And the answer to that, of course, is yes. But Zoroastrianism does offer a, a more logically consistent explanation of the problem of evil than most belief systems do. Of course, if any of you can come up with an explanation of the problem of evil that satisfies everybody, uh, you will be famous and probably wealthy as well. Now, another thing that Zoroastrianism does is that it develops the first systematic explanation of what we call eschatology. That is to say, where things are going, uh, both in terms of the world and in terms of us as individuals. Zoroastrianism has a very strong belief in the afterlife. And in Zoroastrianism, there is both a heaven and a hell. The heaven, of course, is a wonderful place to be. The hell is a particularly horrifying one. Those who live a good life while on earth go to heaven. Those who live a bad life on earth go to hell. But there is a difference between this and the concept that one finds in Christianity, let's say. Hell in Zoroastrianism is temporary. It's taught in Zoroastrian eschatology that ultimately everyone will have the opportunity to be saved. That at the end of time, even those who have ended up in hell will be redeemed and will go to heaven, which, which is kind of a comforting notion if you think that's where you're going to end up. Now, another aspect of Zoroastrian eschatology is the belief in the coming of three saviors. Zoroastrianism taught 
that there will be a Savior every thousand years, once this process starts, all of whom are born by virgin birth, and the last of whom will be known as the Seashiant. The Seashiant, especially, uh, following on the work of his two predecessors, will prepare humanity for the end of the world. And during his reign on earth, the dead will be resurrected, the wicked will be purified, and there will be a final battle between Ahura Mazda and Ahriman, in which Ahriman will be defeated and will be cast into the pit. Now, this will lead to the creation of the eternal kingdom of Ahura Mazda, the coming, if you will, of the kingdom of God. Now that is the basic elements of Zoroastrianism. But Zoroastrianism had been around for a while uh, when the Persians began their conquests, maybe as much as six centuries, maybe just a few years, but whatever the case may be, it spread all over the Persian Empire. And one of the things that often happens when religion spreads in this way is a process that we call syncretism. That is, it begins to pick up local elements and in differing locales it takes on a different character. We see this happen with the Hebrew religion. We see it happen later on with Christianity, which is quite different in Western Europe in the Middle Ages than it is in Eastern Europe in the Middle Ages. And of course today uh, there's even more variation. We see the same thing happen with Islam when it spreads over a vast area. And it happens with Zoroastrianism. So wherever it goes, what tends to happen is that local people who adopt Zoroastrianism also incorporate into it many of their own local beliefs. So for example, Zoroastrianism, when it goes elsewhere, often picks up the local gods. Often the local gods are incorporated into Zoroastrianism and it makes it pretty tricky for us looking back at this from, from several millennia to figure out what was there originally and what was added as Zoroastrianism spread. Another thing that happens is that in many places the old Haoma rite was revived. This certainly doesn't seem to have been Zoroaster's intention, but it happened and this became in many parts of the Persian Empire uh, a routine ritual. And incidentally, the Persian Empire may be short-lived in the sense that you know, in a fairly short time it's overrun by Alexander the Great. But Zoroastrianism is not short-lived. It remains alive even today in little pockets, but in the ancient world it remains immensely influential uh, down through the time of the Roman Empire, and it's not really until Iran is overrun by Islam that it begins to go into something like a decline. So it has a number of centuries to evolve, a number of centuries to spread, and one finds evidence of Zoroastrianism stretching all the way from India to uh, Western Europe. There is a group of Zoroastrians who leave Persia and go into northern India uh, where they become known as the Parsi, and there are still, in fact, Parsi in India today. Uh, piece of trivia for you to amaze your friends and neighbors with. Freddie Mercury, the guy who used to sing for Queen, was a Parsi and in fact practiced Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism also spread in other directions. And one of the things that happens is that not only did the Persians spread Zoroastrianism, Alexander the Great inadvertently did so as well. Alexander, as we will see, created an even bigger empire than the Persians, and everywhere he went, Zoroastrianism went. The Romans come along later and create an even bigger empire than Alexander's, and where they went, Zoroastrianism or its offshoots went as well. 
One of those offshoots was a religion called Mithraism. Now, Mithraism becomes different enough from Zoroastrianism to really be a separate religion in the same way that Christianity breaks away from Judaism. But it becomes a very important religion on the foundation of Zoroastrianism. Mithra, or Mithras, was a very ancient god in Persia. In fact, he goes back to pre-Zoroastrian days. Mithra had been incorporated into Zoroastrianism as one of the lesser deities, but he typically is associated with the sun. In other words, Mithras is the sun god. And in surviving temples of Mithras and in areas where the Persians or Alexander or the Romans had influence and where Mithra was worshipped, you will still find sun images that are reflective of his influence. Mithraism became very, very popular in the Roman Empire. And in the early days of Christianity, it was one of Christianity's principal competitors. You know, Christianity, as, as we'll discuss later on in Unit 3, starts out as a very tiny little group of people in ancient Judea, and it gradually spreads. But it was actually illegal in the Roman Empire until the early 4th century the, uh, AD in the time of Constantine. And so it was in competition with traditional Roman religion and with a number of other Eastern religions as well. One of the big ones was Mithraism. Now, Mithraism was a religion that involved a high amount of ethical content, just like Zoroastrianism. It had a similar eschatology. It had a similar theology. It also involved a ritual that involved uh, the sacrifice of bulls uh, in which penitents stood in a pit underneath the bull and were literally washed, so to speak, in the blood of the bull. One of the most interesting things about Mithraism is its principal holiday. Mithraism is associated with Mithras, who's associated with the sun. Now, every year in the solar year, the days get longer until they reach their longest point at the summer solstice, which is in June, and then they get shorter until they reach their shortest in December with the winter solstice. The winter solstice is something that we normally observe around December the 25th. But the followers of the cult of Mithras observed it on December the 25th, the same day that we celebrate Christmas. And that's not a coincidence. Remember that I said that Mithraism and Christianity were competitors. Also consider this. Christianity grows from being this tiny little group in Judea to being the official religion of the Roman Empire spread all over the Western world in the space of about four centuries. That means that at any given juncture, a substantial number of the people who are Christians are converts from another faith. And one of those faiths, one of the major ones, was Mithraism. Now, the early church had to pick a date to celebrate the birth of Christ. Nobody knows what day that actually happened. The description in the Gospels makes it appear to have happened in the spring. But they chose the date, December the 25th, because this was already familiar to many of the followers of Mithraism, and it stuck. And of course, most followers of Mithraism did eventually, in fact, become Christians. Another offshoot of Zoroastrianism that for a while was a major competitor with Christianity was Manichaeism, which took its emphasis, or, or, or rather was originated, by a human leader called Mani, who lived sometime after the birth of Christ in the, in the East. Manichaeism also is rooted in Zoroastrianism, but it took one aspect of Zoroastrianism to an extreme, and that is the dualism, the contrast between good and 
and evil. Whereas Zoroastrianism had taught that there is a good God and an evil God and that the good God is served by good uh, semi-deities called Ahuras and the bad God is served by demon-like creatures called Devas, it did not extend that to the physical world. But in the views of the Manichaeans, their dualism went so far that they regarded only the spiritual world, the world of spirit, the world of the soul, as good. The physical world, the world that we live in, the material world, if you will, they regarded as hopelessly corrupt and evil. And therefore, they saw everything to do with the physical world as being evil. Now, this means that they sought to deny any aspect of the physical world which might be seen as corrupting. So they encouraged self-denial. They encouraged asceticism, which is a, another word for that. Uh, many of them practiced abstinence when it came to sex, when it came to eating and drinking well, and so on. And this also became very popular in the Roman Empire for a while. Those seeking a, a higher spiritual calling were often drawn to Manichaeism because of its rigors. Doesn't sound like much fun, but for those who were really dedicated, it gave them a good deal of satisfaction. And it was for a while a principal competitor with Christianity. One of the people who was a follower of Manichaeism was the early church father Augustine, or St. Augustine of Hippo. And when he converted to Christianity, he brought a lot of those ideas with him. And that's why you find in Augustine's theology this really sharp emphasis upon the goodness of the spiritual world and the evil of all things uh, in, in the, the material world. The problem of that, of course, for Zoroastrian theology, uh, for Christian theology, or for whatever, is that if the material world is entirely evil and the material world is thought to have been created by God, then it sort of converts that into being God's fault. And that's why ultimately Manichaeism is rejected by most people. But it does mean that Augustine brings a very sharp dualistic strain into Christianity. A third offshoot of Zoroastrianism is something that we call Gnosticism. And Gnosticism is not unique to Zoroastrianism, but it does sort of grow out of that movement and has a great deal of importance, again, in the early history of Christianity. Gnostics are people who tend to believe that special knowledge about God and about the universe has been revealed to them alone and that only they know the truth. And in fact, if you know the early history of Christianity, you know that besides the scriptures that ended up in the New Testament, there are a number of so-called Gnostic Gospels and other Gnostic writings that were produced by these people who were offshoots of Zoroastrianism. In Persia itself, Zoroastrianism continued to flourish until it was wiped out uh, largely by Islam in the 7th century AD, although pockets of it remain today. The Zoroastrians left behind them a sacred literature that is associated with various works or scriptures called the Avestas. And they also had an enormous influence over the three great monotheistic religions of modern times, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All three of those religions have a dualistic element, not as sharp as Zoroastrianism, but all with a god and with Satan. All teach a belief in angels and demons. All believe in the coming of an apocalypse and a final battle. All uh, in resurrection and a last judgment. All in heaven and hell. And in, of course, Judaism and Christianity, there is a belief in a Savior or Messiah. So Zoroastrian influence remains very, very powerful indeed. Persians by and large, made their art and their architecture by incorporating what they found among other people. But much of their art and architecture, though it is quite derivative, is spectacular, and what of it remains is very well worth seeing.
Well, when we come back, we'll discuss another group of people known as the Hebrews. Very important to this region, important to Western civilization. Until next time.